God's Word brings people to faith, it enables people to grow in faith, and it encourages people in turn to share their faith. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the Word of the Lord will stand forever. Christianity is about the wonder of what Christ has done. He loved you before the dawn of time. The answer to our broken world is found only one place, at the cross of Jesus Christ. Well, I invite you to turn with me to the Old Testament and to Psalm 139. And although we are only looking at the closing stanza, I think in light of the time that has elapsed, we should uh, follow along as I read the whole psalm for us. Psalm 139, to the choir master, a psalm of David. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your Spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God! O men of blood, depart from me! They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. Well, I always encourage you to turn to the Bible, and some of you I know do. Uh, others of you perhaps uh, prefer just to listen, and I understand. Uh, but I want you to know that I'm going to turn to a couple of passages this morning, and if you are not ready to turn to them, then you must simply take my word for it and um, perhaps uh, make a note and then go uh, later on. We, we are now, I said um, at the turn of the year, that we would spend four Sunday mornings uh, looking at Psalm 139. Uh, three of those uh, preceded the last three weeks, and now we come to this fourth and final section. In section one, which was verses one to six, we saw how the psalmist says, God knows me intimately. In verses seven to 12, God is with me constantly. In verses 13 to 18, God has made me wonderfully. And now, in 19 to 24, 
God judges me righteously. God judges me righteously. If you remember when we began, we said that although this psalm is attributed to David, there is no historic reference that allows us to pinpoint it with any accuracy. We mentioned that the closing section and the presence of these enemies in verses 19 and 20 probably provided for David the context for the way in which he then reflects on the security that is his in God. And if you like, uh, the presence of the enemies finds him retreating, or if you like, advancing into the security and provision and protection of God. You know when I sit down, you know when I rise up, you hem me in. Not a word of constriction, but a word by way of protection. And if the harsh reality of the wicked uh, did give rise to the first 18 verses, to all that is contained there, then I think we can also say that the first 18 verses prepare the way for this closing section. In other words, when we read this closing section, we need to remember that David is not bloodthirsty, that the one who writes the concluding verses is the same one who has written the first 18 verses who has spoken of the intimacy and care and protection and provision of God. Now, the reason that it's important for me to say that is because, if we are honest, when we come to verse 19, it almost appears to be a discordant note. There's no question that of the 24 verses in the psalm, uh, we would regard it as the most difficult, because it seems on first reading to be a kind of abrupt intrusion, a strange intrusion, causing us, as we read our Bibles, perhaps, or the morning on our own, and we're reading through Psalm 139, and as we perhaps even every so often read it out loud to ourselves so that it might stick in our minds, and we come to verse 19 and we say to ourselves, we just stop and say, well, where in the world did that come from? Well, the answer is it came from verses 1 to 18. It is not an inappropriate interruption. And I hope to be able to show us this morning that it is because of the immensity of David's experience of the living and true God that he responds in the way that he does to the wicked. God is so precious to him that he finds those who speak against God as intolerable. He finds, if you like, their revolt to be revolting. You see, when a person's world is full of God, then that person will actually long for the elimination of evil. If you think about it this morning, you realize that any true believer longs for the day when evil will be destroyed, when sin will be no more when God will complete what he has purposed from all of eternity, a reality that David had only the slightest hint of, and which we understand will be a reality in the new heaven and in the new earth. It is because of the immensity of his love for God that he is so careful to respond to all that opposes God. These individuals, verse 19, are bloodthirsty, they are blasphemous, and they rise up against God. I don't, this is just in my mind right now. I, I, the first car that Sue and I had, I think, cost 60 pounds, maybe $90. It broke down with immense frequency. In fact, its final journey was on a particular road in Edinburgh, where it finally gave up the ghost for the last time. And I pulled it into the side of the street. I got out, I took the bus, and I phoned for a wrecking shop and said, it's yours if you would like it. Uh, so I really would not have been concerned if any teenager had wanted that at all. They could take it and do whatever they liked with it. But imagine that I had been given a beautiful Rolls Royce to drive around. 
Do you imagine the difference between my concern for this Rolls Royce and this old banger of an Austin 1100? <laughs> Fathers, think about your concern for the purity of your daughters. Would you not hate those who would despise her? You've got to get this clear in your mind. David does not turn cantankerous in this final section. It is because he has such an understanding of the magnificence of God, the indescribable God, the holy God, that everything that is antithetical to that God is a concern to him. Now, to try and guide our way through this, I want to point out, first of all, that this is a prayer. To whom does David direct these comments? If you look in your Bible, you will see that he is directing these comments to God. He has begun the psalm, O Lord, Yahweh, you have searched me and you know me. And he's still speaking to God. And he's speaking to him, if you like, in prayer. It is an imprecatory prayer. I am P-R-E-C-A-T-O-R-Y. It is one of about 30 imprecatory psalms in the book of Psalms. An imprecation is essentially a curse. And the cursing psalms are there as an expression of the magnificent holiness of God and how all that opposes God will one day be destroyed. What it is is a prayer, a prayer for divine vengeance. A, pr a prayer for divine vengeance. Now, immediately people will find themselves embarrassed by this. Uh, Old Testament scholars throughout the ages are very, very tempted to do all kinds of things when you come to passages like this. Some will say, well, this was not David, this was somebody put this in here, and so on. It doesn't help anything at all. It's really quite stupid. The fact of the matter is, we are tempted then to play the Old Testament against the New Testament. So people come to this, and they seek to get out of it, as it were, by saying, well, this is the Old Testament, of course. And we know, wrongly, that the Old Testament is obsolete. You don't find this stuff, do you, in the New Testament? Well, yes, actually, you do. Now, here we go. Matthew chapter 23. And you can read the whole of Matthew 23, but we won't. Verse 29, this is Jesus speaking. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we'd lived in the days of our fathers, so on and so on and so on. Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? How are you going to escape the destruction? This is Jesus. This is New Testament. Paul in Galatians and in chapter 1 and in verse 9. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. That is an imprecation. Let him be destroyed. You find the very same thing in a quite dramatic way, still in Galatians and in chapter 5, where he's talking about those who are opposing the gospel, who are making a huge fuss about external things. And he says, but if I, brother, still preach circumcision, which is what they were on about, why am I still persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. Listen, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Sounds like an imprecation to me. Revelation. This will be the last one for now, but there's more to follow. Revelation chapter 6. And they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell in the earth? And then the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich, and the powerful, and everyone slave and free, 
hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Now, if we turn it around the other way, we also need to understand this, that in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament, vengefulness is expressly forbidden. You see how we need a whole Bible to understand the Bible? So that people say, well, they did that kind of stuff in the Old Testament, and it wasn't a problem at all. Well, listen to the book of Leviticus and chapter 19. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So, in other words, in the Old Testament, love for our enemies is not an option. It is an obligation. And at the risk of just causing you great concern with all of this cross-referencing, let me just give you a couple more. Deuteronomy and chapter 32. These are not just chosen arbitrarily, but uh, Deuteronomy 32 and uh, where are we? Verse 35. Vengeance is mine and recompense for the time when their foot shall slip, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and their doom comes swiftly. Well, you will recognize that, won't you, from Romans chapter 12, where Paul is referencing the Old Testament. And he says, we already know this. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will take care of it. So that it's not our responsibility to wreak vengeance to tolerate vengeance, to perpetrate vengeance. That's the first thing. Notice that this is a prayer. He's not standing on a rooftop shouting at people. He is not up in a position of exalted um, kingship saying, look at all these wretched people down there. That is not what he's doing. In fact, I've thought long about it. I wonder, was he standing up? Was he sitting down when he wrote this? Did he write it and then lie down on his bed? Did he lie on his bed and say, oh, Lord, you've searched me and you know me. You know when I'm lying down and so on. Did he, was he still lying on his bed when he said, oh, God, oh, that you would slay, slay the wicked. Oh, that you would bring this to an end. First of all, it's a prayer. Secondly, it's not a program. It's not a program for David to implement. He, like us, is longing for a day when wickedness will be destroyed. The first psalm, remember, blessed is the man who walks in the—doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. By nature, we are that person. No delight in God, no interest at all. You remember how the psalm ends? As for the wicked, they are not so. They're like the chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. David understands this. That's how he began his book of Psalms. This is not a program for David to go out and implement. Well, I won't take time to turn you to it, but if you are interested, you can go back and check, and you'll find a number of occasions when, when we studied in First and Second Samuel, David consistently refused to take matters into his own hands. Do you remember? In the cave, and his friends said, take him out now. You can kill him now. David says, no, I'm not going to do that. I will not do that. I will not take matters into my own hands. David realizes that he is not driven by spite or vindictiveness or by a desire to get even. He is driven by a zeal for God. He's God's king, and as a result, his enemies were not simply private enemies. They were enemies 
of God. Remember, again, when we studied in First and Second Samuel, we said, well, why would the king then exercise such punishment on those who were opposed to him? And the answer is because they were opposed to God Almighty. He was God's king, and therefore their opposition to him was an opposition to God. Walt Kaiser, who came here many, many years ago in the early 80s, has a wonderful little passage on this where he says, these wicked enemies that are here embody wickedness as they carry out the program that is anti-God, anti-Messiah, anti-promise. Doig, and you may remember Doig, D-O-E-G, you can look him up, Doig, Cush, and Ahithophel are not your average criminal or hostile types. They are the culmination and the final fruit of all falsehood, greed, hate, cruelty, and treachery aimed against the very means of their own salvation, opposed to the very means of the salvation which God has provided in his Messiah. Now, I will not divert from course, but it was inescapable to see the little of, what was it, the Grammys and the British singer Sam Smith dressed up literally as the devil, singing the great song, Unholy. Part of me says, oh, that you would slay the wicked. Part of me says, oh, God, save him. Save him. He stands opposed to the very means of his own salvation. The fact is that David sees evil, and he sees how evil evil is, and so he hates it, as he says here in verse 22, with a complete hatred. The challenge for us, isn't it, that it's, it's, it's hard for us to give voice to that kind of expression of divine purity without actually it being mixed with an agenda of personal venom and animosity. There is a perversity about our souls that while at the same time saying, I absolutely despise and hate that, and something in your mind going, I wonder what it would be like to do that. I wonder what that would be like. We have to be very honest, don't we? It's a prayer. It's not a program. Thirdly, in dealing with it, it reveals our predicament or our problem, a problem to which I've already alluded. Because if we are honest, as I say, within ourselves, we are hesitant to pray in that way. And not just because uh, this was the prayer of God's king, and we are not God's king, but because we actually find this kind of confrontation to be distasteful. And yet, I was held by just a sentence from Dick Lucas this week where he said in passing, in a, in a talk that he gave in the 80s, it's never wise to dismiss from the Bible things we find difficult or distasteful. It's never wise for us to seek to dismiss from the Bible the things we find difficult or distasteful. These are not aberrations. These are part of the living Word of God. So then what is our predicament? Twofold. Number one, we are confused in our thinking. Confused in our thinking. You say, well, you can speak for yourself in this regard. Okay, then I am confused, easily confused in my thinking because we have grown very comfortable with the idea of love the sinner, hate the sin. And David doesn't seem to be doing that. No, he actually hates the sinner. I would like that you got rid of them, that you destroyed them. They are malicious in their intent. They take your name in vain. They blaspheme you. I loathe them. I hate them. 
I count them my enemies. Now, there is truth to this, isn't there? That we do love the sinner and we hate the sin. We could think of ways in which that would be immediately applied. But it is evil, easy to overstress that notion, to make that notion say something that it doesn't mean. Listen to John Stott. Evil is not something abstract. It exists in the hearts and ways of evildoers. So, when the judgment of God falls, it will fall on evildoers, not upon evil in abstract. So, David recognizes this. He realizes that he lives in a world in which evil abounds. He's not speaking about evil as a construct of a, an idea. No, because evil reveals itself in the hearts and lives of each of us. And so, again, our confused thinking has to be brought underneath the jurisdiction of the Bible. The Bible will help us out on every case. So, for example, John chapter 3 and verse 16. Everybody knows it, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. That's John 3, 16. John 3, 36, 35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. 